So, uh, welcome everyone to this fifth colloquium in the series. And today's speaker is Professor M. Krishna Murthy from TFR Mumbai and TCIS Hyderabad. Uh, before moving on to the colloquium, I would like to request Vaibhav Prabhu Desai to introduce this speaker. Yeah. So, thank you, Aditya. It is actually indeed an honor for me to introduce Professor M. Krishna Murthy to this audience. Uh, MK, after his PhD in 1995, uh, MK, that's what we fondly call, call him. So MK, after 1995, finishing his PhD, he joined Jilla Boulder, uh, Steve D. Leone's group for postdoc. And in 1998, he joined TFR, uh, Department of Nuclear and Atomic Physics, as a regular faculty member. Uh, and, and then onwards, he is with uh, associated with TIFR, and now he is in uh, Hyderabad campus of uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. MK has uh, won several awards, and some of them, uh, which are highlight, are uh, Swarnajanti Fellowship in 2006, uh, also uh, BM Birla Science Prize in 2003, uh, Young Scientist Medal from INSA in 2001. Uh, he was also um, head of the Max Planck India Partner Group in 2007, as well as uh, he is a fellow of Indian Science Academy of Sciences, where he was actually uh, an associate with it in 1999 and eventually became uh, a fellow in 2013. And he also won DAE SRC Outstanding Investigator Award in 2015. MK uh, is, uh, I mean, my fond memories with MK, interaction with MK uh, goes back to my student days that starting from 2000 and uh, not a single interaction I, I remember with MK, the physics interaction that I remember with MK where after talking to him, I have not come out enthusiastic about doing an experiment or, you know, investigating something more than what I have done or what I have been reporting. And that's, that's the energy, that's the, uh, that's the positivity that we, we have always got from MK and MK is a, is a shining star of uh, DNAP and under whose light now the atomic and molecular physics activities are shaping up in Hyderabad campus. So without taking any further time, I invite uh, MK to give his colloquium to this audience. MK, please. Thank you, Ivo, for a very uh, generous introduction. Uh, I hope I deserve some of it. <laughs> No, you all of it. Come on. <laughs> okay, so I am going to give uh, uh, give you a talk about what uh, I have been uh, uh, passionate about for the past few years. Uh, this is actually a, a, a summary of uh, three of my students' uh, PhD thesis work, and the topic is, of course, uh, how to use intense lasers to generate neutral atoms and how to stay neutral under extreme provocation. Uh, pun intended, of course. Uh, so just to give you a, a brief uh, about TFR, uh, uh, TFR has been doing intense laser plasma physics, uh, atomic physics uh, related to uh, laser plasma interactions. Uh, there are many uh, uh, things that are going on. Uh, you can see the website to get more information. And of course, as Weibo said, we have now started a new activity in TFR Hyderabad. And unfortunately, I'm not talking about the TFR Hyderabad activity because that's slightly more into plasma than atomic and molecular physics. But uh, hopefully, at some other time, you'll be able to hear me. So these are the, of course, people who I had to thank for uh, uh, many of the things that we have been doing for the past few years. And especially these three people, uh, Raji, Malai, and Sharai, whose uh, thesis some uh, gels well with uh, the theme of uh, uh, doing atomic and molecular physics with intense lasers in perspective of generating neutral atoms. And this, of course, is the Hyderabad team in a little bit older picture, but I think the people are still uh, 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 there. Uh, some new people had added, but I think that's fine. So the plan of my talk is uh, assuming that there are some people who are not exposed to intense laser science will give you a brief introduction. And then I'll talk about neutral atom acceleration. And there are three different case studies I was telling you that uh, of using different 
facets of electron and recombination or charge transfer physics to be able to uh, generate a beam of neutral atoms from intensely plasmas. So, uh, so I'll try and tell about this. So, when you talk about intense lasers, uh, we all know what is plasma. It's a soup of ions and electrons and temperature is very high. Sun is an example of a, a very hot uh, plasma. The density is very low. On the other hand, the normal matter that we see, a piece of stone, piece of wood, is a condensed matter system which is at a very low temperature. Can we think of a matter that is a fusion between the two? Extremely high temperature, but at the same time, density of that of a solid or even higher than that. And that's what we call as warm, dense matter. Uh, there is very little we know about it. There is very little we can understand about it because we can't hold it, we can't uh, reproducibly uh, sample it. A lot of theoretical uh, stuff is uh, extrapolated, interpreted, but how do we do this? And uh, if you have to uh, do that, but the, one of the problem is as you have a higher density and if I supply any energy to make it into a, a plasma, then it, uh, there is a natural expansion of uh, atoms. So ice melts to become a water. But on the other hand, if you can do it at ultra fast time scales that uh, atoms don't have time to move, then you can actually do this at very, very uh, high densities. Like you can take a piece of solid and before the solid density decreases, you can increase the temperature to a very, very high uh, level of a plasma. In fact, you can increase the density even hundredfold larger than what you have by using uh, shocks into the system. So uh, intense laser science is basically a discipline where we want to use uh, intense ultra-short laser pulses to produce matter in extreme conditions of density, temperature, pressure, and so on, and understand how these systems uh, behave. So uh, how do we go about doing this? Light. So let's start with a simple thing of light. Light is uh, electromagnetic radiation. And if you shine it on a, in any uh, atomic and molecular substance, you can excite it, you can, uh, uh, and whole of what we know about quantum mechanics actually comes from this excitation, the excitation physics. And uh, so it said the, one of the biggest parameter uh, is the wavelength. As you, if you want to excite an atom to a particular energy level, you have to tune the energy to that level. And then like a resonator, atom absorbs energy or emits energy and you have absorption emission that we see every day. This is what we would call as uh, linear spectroscopy. As you increase the intensity and the intensity is energy per unit time, uh, per unit area, and then you start seeing some things that unusually happens. And this intense, uh, the time decrease uh, basically for us translates to make using short pulse lasers. And you can actually do nonlinear spectroscopy with it. You can produce uh, two photon, three photon interaction so that three photons simultaneously interact with the atom within the reaction time of the electromagnetic radiation so that you can have a transition which is otherwise in linear spectroscopy not allowed but becomes allowed. You can have excitation, you can have emission in this fold and so on. And this is what uh, normal uh, lasers do, uh, gigawatt per centimeter square or so. But if you increase the intensity even higher, then you can actually, uh, anything about 10 to the 10 watts per centimeter square, or 10 to the <coughs> between 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 12, you can ionize any piece of solid. In fact, if you cross 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 14, you can ionize any piece of atom. In fact, they say that, you know, uh, at uh, very, very high intensities, like the, what we do in the experiment, the only thing that does not uh, change its nature is a, if you can get a piece of neutron star. So, um, electrons will be thrown out of the atom, ionization will happen and not only, uh, so intense field is always related to ionization and when you have a large number of ions, you always create a plasma. Now how high is high? Here of course is a relative word and usually for us high uh, low has to be compared with some benchmark and the benchmark that we normally use is the electric field with which the atoms and molecules are uh, held in their natural state and ground state. Um, so for example, for a hydrogen atom, the electron is bound by a static potential uh, field of uh, 10 to the 9 volts per centimeter. And if I uh, use that as a 
electrostatic field um, uh, and the intensity of the electromagnetic radiation with that E square would be something like 10 to the 16 watts per second square. So, and that is also called the atomic unit of intensity. And that's also sometimes interpreted as intense or super intense laser fields where there is no choice for any matter exposed to this intensity to undergo ionization and ionization of very uh, strong nature. So, uh, as I said, intensity is energy per unit area per unit time. And the way we can actually get this very, very high voltage per centimeter square is by reducing the pulse duration and increase the pulse energy. And so if you go down to a femto uh, time second uh, regime, then and if you have, even if you have a millijoule pulse, the effective watts per centimeter square is uh, uh, 10 to the 12 watts per centimeter square. That's what we call as a terawatt laser. Now, you focus it down to a few tens of microns, which is easily possible with a lens uh, every day that we can use uh, without anything speciality. This actually can become very, very high intensity uh, than more than what it can ever uh, think in normal circumstances. And that creates very, very intense effects. For example, if you have a one and a half EV photon beam of a terawatt coming and focus down, you can have a peak intensity that's anywhere between 10 to the 16 to 10 to the 19 watts per centimeter square. So as I said, 10 to the 12 is actually good enough to ionize. And we are talking about six to eight orders of magnitude larger than what you, uh, you have at ionization threshold. So very soon these electrons will start interacting with the light. It becomes a very, very hot dense plasma, which uh, like any other plasma, uh, produces light, produces electrons, ions, and so on. And if you look at the state of the art the intensities that you can produce routinely in many labs today, you can get 10 to the 18 watts per centimeter square. And this is an example of how uh, a laser plasma action happens in its full uh, glory at uh, 10 to the 18 watts per centimeter square on a piece of target. Target could be anything in principle. So you have, uh, because it's an ultra short pulse, you have uh, electrons uh, with a high ponderomotive energy being driven. Ponderomotive energy is basically the gradient force uh, with, uh, which drives the electrons and you have a very ultra short pulse, the gradients can be very, very large. And these electrons, uh, because they are produced in ultra short uh, area and uh, short area and ultra short time scales, the current densities are very large. You can get 10 to the 8 amperes per centimeter square. The electrons can be driven to a relativistic velocity. You'll, I'll show you some more examples of it. And because uh, atoms have no time to move, within a picosecond, the electrons, uh, or less than a picosecond, the electrons leave. Then followed by the protons uh, experiencing a huge electrostatic potential for them to get accelerated. And when you have a hard dense plasma, you always have X-rays and terahertz. Uh, a, a whole electron uh, electromagnetic spectrum being emitted. The electrons, uh, when they are relativistic, of course, can induce uh, electron induced nuclear reactions, photon induced nuclear reactions. So, the temperature we are talking about routinely is about 100 million Kelvin in these kind of cases. The pressures of a gigabar densities could be 100 times more than a solid magnetic field can be a gigawatt. So, this is the scenario, the stage that is set. And uh, now, it's not just the nonlinear physics where you think things increase uh, in some sort of uh, 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 x square manner or x cube manner, but things actually change quite dramatically. Just to give a, my own favorite example, if you like, for example, look at harmonic order generation. I mean, basically, we're talking about five photons interacting simultaneously with a neon atom to produce a fifth harmonic or a seventh harmonic because it's a central symmetric system, we produce uh, order harmonics. And uh, for example, the no no normal perturbative physics will tell you that by the time you go to uh, something like 11th order, uh, relative to the fifth order, the uh, intensity should fall down by four orders of magnitude. Relative to the first order, it's probably like uh, 15 orders of magnitude lower. So, which means the intensity of the higher order process, as you know, the perturbative physics should be very, very low. But when you do this kind of uh, uh, intensities, you see things changing quite dramatically. For example, here we are talking about a harmonic generation from a 15th harmonic to all the way to the 65th harmonic. This is my very, very old uh, data during my postdoc. I'm just doing this, using this as an example. 
so from all the way from 15th harmonic to 16th harmonic, the harmonic generation is extremely flat. And of course it drops at a higher, higher uh, threshold, but it, it can be, uh, so it, it is completely non-intuitive several years ago or 20 years ago when this was being done. Of course, this is a, a, a stream of research which is going by leaps and bounds and it's uh, things like uh, uh, tabletop synchrotrons or uh, where you can produce a synchrotron like beam, a laser beam that goes all the way to 1 to 2 keV or even 5 keV these days at a very high repetition rate of kilohertz or even uh, tens of kilohertz and the pulse of course is ultra short two and a half and uh, two seconds uh, uh, at the shortest uh, pulse some of the experiments that people have been doing this is also what i'm giving you is also about eight years old um, there is a lot more uh, dramatic uh, changes that have happened that has been happening but just to give you an example that just by changing the uh, the uh, the field changing the sh short duration changing the lambda in this case you know instead of doing at 800 nanometers which is the yellow line you can see that if you do at 3.9 microns you can shift this whole spectrum all the way to uh, 0.7 uh, keV so there are lots of buttons and parameters that people can change and have been uh, pushing those buttons to interpret get away so um, uh, lots of other kind of things that are happening, for example, you can use this plasma to generate very, very high electron beams. This is another example where you shine in an electron beam and within a millimeter you have a 200 kV to 300 kV electron beam that is being generated. And the latest of this is you have a 20 centimeter capillary guide discharge, you shoot a petawatt laser into this and you produce a GVB. So a lot of very non-intuitive physics that happens. And of course, ion generation, I will not talk about this. So the question that uh, we have been asking is in such very, very strongly ionized piece, uh, domain, is it possible to have a neutral atom accelerator? Can I convert and can I modify a laser uh, uh, ionization scheme into also a nucleation scheme? If you want to do a conventional neutral acceleration, that's what happens every day in most of our conventional spectrometers or machines. Like electron starts with the negative ions, you uh, you strip the electrons out of it, and you will get positive ions. Or you have a ionization of a positive uh, species with a gas cell. You can uh, attach electrons by charge transfer, and uh, typical cross sections are about 8 to the 16 watts per centimeter, 16 centimeter square. And so, for example, if I typically uh, uh, want to uh, transfer a large number of electrons then of course I need a large uh, gas densities and uh, that can be a problem. Uh, high energy ions are very good because you can produce a collimated intense uh, spatial beams. Now the question is can I convert them to uh, neutrals? So the, the, as I said, the, we want to use uh, a laser as a highly efficient uh, plasma neutralizer. So if you look at the conventionally, the electron, uh, there are two methods of reducing a charge. Either you pick up a free electron by electron and recombination, a Q becomes Q minus one plus, or you have a charge transfer collision with an atom, and you uh, of course the charge transfer collision cross sections are very high. The electron recombinations are very low cross section process unless the low elect electron temperature is very low. The cross section is actually very very bad. And uh, in terms of uh, free electron pickup or uh, electron and recombination, there are three flavors in which you can do this either triple recombination, dielectronic recombination or photo recombination. Tri uh, triple recombination is where two electrons simultaneously interact with an ion to form a reduced uh, charge state. But uh, typically the cross sections are quite low. As I said, charge transfer cross sections are 10 minus 16, but these are in the range of 10 to the minus 21 even at 10 EV. But more importantly for this uh, study, the cross section can be converted to uh, the critical uh, uh, time in which this reaction kind of uh, happens, mean time, and that mean time is about 500 picoseconds. So it means there is 500 picoseconds of interaction uh, where time required between electrons and ions to undergo recombination. You can have dielectronic recombination where the electron is picked up in an excited state and that can de excite uh, in about a picosecond or uh, so, depending on how the uh, de excitation mechanism is, and then you have a uh, uh, charge reduced atom produced. 
direct photo recombination directly in one step the electron uh, is captured and uh, you have a photon coming out this again the cross section is uh, slightly higher but it's uh, still 10 minus 21 at uh, 10 EV electrons and the reaction time for that is around 700 picoseconds. So if you look at in a very intense laser plasma where the whole plasma survives for a picosecond or so or two pico, uh, 10 picoseconds at the max, we are talking about uh, and the temperatures we are talking about is the bulk temperature of 100 to 500 keV, uh, EV and the maximum electron temperature going all the way to MEVs. So electron temperatures are very large, electrostatic fields are also very large. We are talking about 100 megavolt per meter kind of fields. So even if there is an electron capture that happens and an excited state is produced, in these uh, fields there is uh, very little chance of them to survive. So typically nobody talks about recombination in these kind of conditions and using these kind of lasers. But when we did these experiments, uh, we found something unusual. So just to give you uh, these experiments I'm talking about are with a uh, nano cluster produced by supersonic jet expansion. We're talking about 10,000 to 100,000 atoms of uh, clusters being exposed to intense lasers. You can, you can instantly ionize the atoms to a very, very high charge state. Because the electrons don't have much time to pick up energy in this kind of system, there is not much of electron damping that can happen. Electron energies are typically around uh, 1 to 2, uh, 2 keV, whereas ion energies, because there is no supply of low energy electrons, all the electrons that leave, leave a charged state, a uh, highly charged system back, and ion energies are about 700 keV. And we can interpret these by uh, what is uh, we all know as a Thomson spectrometer, where you have electric and magnetic fields supplied to bend the charge states, unlike uh, nice atomic physics experiments we have because these kind of systems produce a very broadband uh, ion and charge state spectrum. So you have uh, energies going all the way from 1 keV to like uh, 1 MeV with uh, what is written here as 100 MeV keV line. You have a charge states produced from 1 to 8 uh, that we can very clearly see but if you have a, go to a higher charge states you can produce all the way up to 14 and uh, the charge state spectrum for example is uh, as I said uh, is uh, very very uh, dramatically high here. So this is an experiment where you have about 20,000 atoms exposed to the intense laser and the mean charge is about 7 plus which means um, in average about 7 electrons per atom are lost in a 20,000 to 40,000 atom cluster and the lowest charge states we can measure in a Thomson parabola in these conditions is about 5 and the high charge states going all the way to 12. Now, the, uh, all the experiments till uh, about eight, nine years ago have been done at uh, very, very low density clusters. Though the, now we are talking about here when I say low density, I'm not density of atoms, but density of clusters, of 40,000 atom clusters density. The, the operations is at a regime where we have almost 100% clusterization because we are putting at uh, 10, atmos at, uh, 10 to 40 atmospheres uh, the electron, the ion temperature, the neutral atom temperature is something like 7 degree Kelvin when they leave the pulse wall. And if you put a skimmer and take at a, uh, uh, a chamber pressure of 10 minus 7 tau, your cluster density is very, very low. And at this is what I was telling you the experiment about. Now we set up an experiment not to do at this 10 to the 10 clusters per centimeter cube, but very close to the pulse wall where the chamber pressure is about 10 minus. 6 tor, 10 minus 5 tor, and the cluster density is about 100 times larger into the 12 clusters per centimeter cube. So anywhere between 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6, we have done these experiments. Cluster densities varied over from 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 14 uh, clusters density. But what you see is dramatic change of the charge state. Where we were seeing at the same laser conditions, just by reducing the density uh, 100 fold, the charge state spectrum has completely got shifted. And from mean charge state of being 8, it has become a mean charge state of 2. And the another important change is the high charge state, for example, an 8 plus or, or a uh, 10 plus charge here uh, was about 100 keV. Now, uh, this is the 12 plus, for example, sorry, what I'm showing here. At the low density, a 12 plus charge state has about uh, 140 keV uh, ion energy. But what we are seeing is when I increase my density a little bit, my ion charge energy has not changed at all. 
it's nearly stay same 100 110 kV, but the charge state has reduced to 2 from 12. So, which means we have completely changed the whole spectrum from a very high charge state to a very low charge state from a mean charge of 8 to 2 without losing any kinetic energy of the iron itself. So, obviously, the, the way one can think of this is somehow there is a very, very effective charge recombination that's happening that a 14 plus gun converted to a 1 plus or 2 plus. So, if you can actually push 14 plus or 7 plus to a 1 plus, what is the possibility of getting neutral atoms? And if you, if there are neutral atoms in our uh, uh, Thomson spectrometer, they will not be undef they will not be deflected, and you can actually see that at the so-called the central spot. And to to interpret that this is neutral atoms, what we do is we measure the arrival time at this spot. So when you do at very low densities, you see that there is hardly any signal, and most of the signal is due to the photons. Uh, this is at a, uh, at a three times more uh, collection time than what you get with the ions. But if you uh, do that at a slightly higher density, this is what we see. That the charge states are low, but the ion signal is exactly reproducible to same as what you get with the ions. So high uh, electric and magnetic fields used to deflect the ions, throw the, all the ions out of the, uh, the detector so that only the central spot is seen. You measure the time of light and you see still a large percentage of atoms are there in this central spot and they are in the form of a neutral atom. And if you measure this time of flight of the neutral atoms and convert it to ion spectra and do this as a comparison of ions plus neutrals plus ions being thrown away by putting a very high electromagnetic fields and looking at the signal, you can actually get a fraction of neutralization that has happened. And this is the ions plus neutrals in blue and uh, in green it's neutral. So you can see that these curves are almost matching with each other, showing that there is almost a 90 plus percent plus neutralization. So we are talking about a 14 electrons being stripped out of an atom, having a huge Coulomb charge, ions being accelerated to MeV, and then all 14 electrons being put back. And as I said, the control parameter is the density, this is the variation with, of this neutralization with respect to density, all the way from 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12, we did all the way up to 10 to the 15. At 10 to the 10, we see hardly any neutralization, uh, but at, uh, as you increase, the, there is a dramatic rise, but of course, though, uh, that region between 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 12, it's not very easy to cover, but uh, if you multiply the density to length, that's where actually the real parameter comes out. So this is our, for this particular length, at from 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 14, you see that you can change it very nicely from 40 to almost 90%. Now, so this is the story so far. You have a 100 frames per second laser coming and hitting a cluster, tripping off uh, seven to eight electrons per atom. The Coulomb charge uh, builds up on the system in about a picosecond. The cluster explodes to produce MeV ions with uh, 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 7 plus charge, but then if you do it at a slightly higher density and putting what I would call as intercluster interaction, which I'll tell you a little bit more about, you will see that most of the atoms are in low charge state now, but high kinetic energy, and you have put back all the electrons back in that. So as I said, there is only two ways of picking up an electron, either a free electron being combined or a charge transfer with respect to a collision with a neutral atom. And you can actually write, uh, Automatic Physics has studied this very, very elaborately of how the uh, uh, cross sections vary with all these parameters. And the experimental scenario is this, that you have one or two millimeters of gas, a uh, 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 50 to uh, 70 microns of a focal region of the laser where this extreme ionization has happened. And then the ions are falling through this one millimeter of uh, unionized neutral uh, atom uh, or neutral cluster regime and passing towards a detector to be detected as a neutral. And by when you switch off this density and switch off the and make the collimator beam into a 100 micron 10 minus 10 uh, cluster density, you can switch off all this neutralization and get all the 8 plus charge. But when you switch on this uh, uh, high density regime, then you can have the neutralization. 
So the eight plus uh, average state has become two plus. Now I can actually put this charge transfer calculations and uh, uh, calculate what should be the charge state spectrum for my experimental condition. And what we see is the charge transfer, of course, is effective. And in average, you can actually charge, transfer about two or three uh, uh, electrons per atom. So which means the seven plus charge, charge state has become four or five. In this case, if you have a charge transfer at 10 to the 12 clusters per centimeter cube. But in experiment, what we are seeing is actually much larger shift. If you see this in terms of neutralization, things are much more dramatic. If you have, if you have the at 10 to the 14 clusters per centimeter cube, your charge transfer neutralization should, is expected to be about 60%. And what we see is about 80%. But if you go down to 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13, the charge transfer cross-section falls down very dramatically or the probability falls down uh, dramatically, not the cross-section. And the uh, simulation shows that the uh, charge transfer probability should be less than 1%, but in experiment, what we see is close to 60%. So what is this dramatic change? And uh, thanks to EK, we got uh, explored to this uh, Rydberg excitations physics. Uh, so when you have this uh, uh, electron being captured by an atom in a Rydberg excited state, then your uh, effective radius is very large, your n square is very large, and then the cross section actually is shown by the uh, old experiments that you can actually uh, almost increase the cross section by four orders of magnitude. So, can this happen to our case where because the ions move out uh, much later than electrons, first the electrons come out of the focal volume, electrons go and hit the clusters and they ionize and excite, and if there is enough excitation, uh, uh, excited atoms or clusters being produced, then the cross-section of the charge transfer cross-section can increase very dramatically. Now, if that is happening, we need to see that in terms of electrons. So we do uh, a measurement of electron spectra, both at low density case and at the high density case. And this is what we see, that all the low energy electrons are completely uh, consumed in the, uh, and nothing is reaching the microchannel plate detector, uh, put at uh, the 10 minus 4, 5, 10 minus 6 star. Uh, vacuum conditions where the mean free path is actually much larger than the uh, uh, than any possible collisions. But uh, uh, if you have a density of clusters working, then this excitation should be possible. So high energy electrons are walking through, but low energy electrons are completely gone. And uh, this low energy electrons we can actually interpret by the electron ion collisions, both in terms of the excitations that are possible in terms of ionization that is possible. So we model the electron emission from the focal volume and you look at the electron loss by both by elastic and inelastic collisions. And by that, we can actually get a fraction of the atoms or the clusters that we ionized or excited. And unlike our regular atomic physics experiments, this is a pulsed current because if the electrons are coming out in a picosecond burst, the the in a 10 micron to 50 micron volume and at very close to the the focus the the electron density is very high because of which you have a larger fraction of ionization and excitation and this is uh, excitation cross, uh, cross uh, the probability as a function of the density and you can see at, at you know at 10 to the 14 uh, cl clusters per centimeter cube you can have actually a, a reasonable fraction of the electron density. And we use the guidance of the experiment as uh, uh, to see how much of a charge transfer, uh, sorry, not charge transfer, excitation, uh, Rydberg excitation probability is there. And from this fitting of this experimental data, we can get the fraction of the uh, atoms that are excited. So you have, as I said, just to repeat, that you have a laser focal volume, Everything is frozen in about one or two picoseconds. The electrons come out uh, in that uh, one to five picoseconds. They, the, at the very close proximity of that 10 micron rim or 100 micron rim around the laser focus, the excitation probability is very, very high. And uh, a substantial fraction, which is almost 30% uh, in, the, in the lowest possible estimate that we have, in about uh, 100 to 100 micron region, about 30-40% of the atoms can be excited. Now, if you put this 30-40% of the atoms to be excited, uh, can I see it experimentally? 
Yes, of course, if you put an optical spectrometer and look at the emissions, you can see very, very beautiful, very, very strong uh, line emissions of different excited states that are possible with argon. And from the, from the experimental data of the electrons, we can get the fraction of the, simulate the fraction of the atoms excited, and we put the effective uh, uh, end state of the excitation as a variable parameter and try and interpret the uh, experiments that we saw. And we saw that by that, by, uh, even if by using the, the lowest possible fraction the, of the excitation that you have, uh, if you have an average uh, gamma or the n by nc of 9, you can have actually like it's the, the, the um, experiment closing ma closely matching with the uh, experiment, the theory closing matching experiment. So the interpretation that we are now able, with which the only way we are able to explain the experiment is that these electrons go, get excited, excite the uh, target nearby, and then charge transfer with, uh, with the Rydberg excited state. Now, if we are able to transfer eight electrons or 10 electrons per atom, why not an extra electron to produce anti ions? That was, uh, that had to be uh, possible if for us to see this experiment to be working correctly. So we make a simulation. Of course, the argon ions uh, cannot uh, pick up extra electron, but an oxygen can. So we make uh, CO2 clusters. We, we use the same excitation physics and uh, to our uh, 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 satisfaction, we could see a beam of uh, carbon and uh, oxygen ions uh, not beam actually emission of carbon and uh, uh, O minus ion coming out like a nice parabola, and we can actually change that ion uh, energy and correspondingly show the a change in uh, neutral atom uh, the, the negative ion energies, and so you can convert. We can show that there is a direct correlation between the cluster size, the laser intensity, and positive ion spectrum and the negative ion spectrum to be able to show. And more importantly, we use the same uh, excitation manifold because the first uh, in the in the uh, ionization uh, effective ion excitation energies of the argon and CO two are uh, have uh, reasonable comparisons. So if I use the same uh, gamma equal to nine, uh, I can actually interpret not only the argon's experiment but also in the uh, uh, O minus and C minus experiment to produce the same effective uh, fraction of uh, negative ion to positive ion ratio that we see. So this was uh, a story that was published some time back. So the intense laser at, uh, uh, system is actually a very, very rich uh, source of uh, low energy electrons. Here, when I say low energy, I'm talking about 100 EV electrons, which has a reasonable excitation uh, cross section and since they are produced like a pulse current in a small area, in a small time, the effective uh, current is very large. You have a much larger uh, fraction of these uh, excitations possible than otherwise. And you produce uh, excited, Rydberg excited atoms and ions which come 5 picoseconds or 10 picoseconds later. Before these electro excited atoms can de excite, which I said was like 100, 200 uh, picoseconds, you have this excitation energy, which can be used, or uh, this electron in a higher orbit being uh, doing much effective transfer to produce uh, neutral atoms. Now the question, of course, is: Is this one of a case? Can we actually do this in much more uh, 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 efficient manner with other kind of conventional solid targets that people normally use in these kind of experiments? So. Uh, of course, in terms of also uh, when we produce this paper, our uh, we have to give a sort of uh, what will be the novelty with some as neutral atom source like this. And one of the thing was like you know you can produce neutral atom beams in a confined manner with the laser. And uh, uh, people like Professor Kaur was asking saying that you know can you push this to like a beam like situation that to with a hydrogen, atom, not argon, because then it can be used for some plasma applications. Now the clusters is, uh, though it, there is some anisotropy, but it is largely an isotropic emission. So it is not like a beam, it is whatever ion uh, angular distributions are, the neutral uh, angular distributions correlate with that. And that also of course is a, a papers that were uh, cross-checked with, with this whole model. 
about angular distributions of ions, electrons, and neutral atoms. So, if it is normal charge transfer physics, neutral atoms should not uh, care about where the electrons go. But because it's a uh, Rydberg excitation physics, the electrons, uh, wherever the electrons are maximum, the neutral atoms are also maximum. So that also correlates uh, pretty well with the whole scheme. So the question is, can we do this for with a solid target? Now, so so I'll tell you two particular cases. One is with uh, heavy atoms like copper. Now, why we do with heavy atoms? <coughs> I'll come back to this later. And the experiment is very very similar. You have an ion coming and hitting a solid, producing uh, ions and uh, of uh, different charge states. We built uh, another spectrometer version for uh, for the solid experiments where we can clearly see different charge states. And the the physics is slightly different from the clusters. Uh, you have a small uh, 10 micron or a uh, 20 micron region which is instantly ionized by the laser. And uh, the, there is a hot electron current that drives into the system. So the target is very thin. Of course, the high energy electrons, which are like tens of keV, will easily walk through uh, the few micron target. You have a hot electrons coming out at the backside because of which ions uh, follow the electrons and you have an ion emission at the back. You also have an ion emission of similar kind in the front, but because the laser is never a clean pulse, which means that it's not like a delta function, how much ever we want it to be, yeah, because we are talking about very, very high intensities, even one uh, ten thousandth of the peak intensity of 10 to the 18 is good enough for ionization. So you always have a plasma that is generated even before the ions move. So, and so that uh, is uh, uh, what happens. And uh, in unlike the gas case where I can have neutral atoms that are there for charge transfer, here we are talking about an experiment which are at uh, uh, 10 minus 6 or 10 minus 5 or uh, gas and uh, since we are talking about a piece of solid there is uh, 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 and, and the kind of uh, uh, um, uh, in, in about 10 centimeters of the travel distance your charge transfer uh, collisions are very very poor and the, uh, the neutral the charge transfer collision contribution is very very little so largely the dynamics here is by the electrons. Now here again there are uh, the questions and uh, uh, surprises because as we I said the cross section is very very low for uh, electron capture unless the electron temperature is very very low and when you saw talking about low we are talking about 10 EV or less whereas here in the plasmas we are talking about very very high electron temperature. So will there be neutrals or not uh, there was not too much of studies in the past so, but when we started looking for neutrals in the same method by which I apply very, very high fields and throw away all the ions and then I get, uh, I measure the arrival time. And so when you don't have the high fields, all the ions are reaching the detector, the time of flight will give you a spectrum that is in red. And when I, when I apply very, very high fields to throw away all the ions out of the uh, detector, this is what I see in the green. There is about... 20%, 25% neutralization. It is not as dramatic as what I had in the clusters. And we wanted to look for different mechanisms by which you can increase the neutralization. We tried several different things. Porous target, metallic target, dielectric target, nanoparticle coated target, assuming that there will be some ablation and the ablation will produce neutral atoms, uh, uh, a plume which can ever do effective charge transfer. You can increase it by uh, from 25% to about 30%, 40% with any of this uh, sequence, but nothing more than that. But to our surprise, the, the solution was actually the simplest, that if you actually translate the target from, all the way of, uh, from the focus, far away from the focus by about 100 microns or so, things can quite uh, change quite dramatically. And this is the, uh, the Thompson parabola uh, image. So at 12 microns, you see that ion emission is very, very, uh, the ion spot is very small and you have a high charge states. But as you increase the spot uh, size and you take a systematic, you see there is a systematic dramatic increase in the neutral atom spot. Of course, you can measure the, uh, the, the ion energy, the ion and the all particle spectrum, 
So this is uh, when I say all particles, I'm talking about ions plus neutrons in the time of flight. And then when I apply very high voltage, all the ions are thrown out, you get only neutrals. And here see by doing this trick of uh, changing the focus, you can actually push the neutralization from 20-25% that I had before to almost 80-85%. And uh, uh, of course, this is the neutral atom spectrum at different focal areas. This I wanted to show because if you change the laser focus, you change your effective intensity. So your ion energies do go down, but it does not go down very dramatically. There is a factor of five to uh, change in intensity uh, in the ion energies from uh, one MeV you go down to half MeV as the max or 0.2 MeV as the max uh, ion energy. But you see there is a dramatic change in the neutralization. So we are able to shift this whole uh, business of ions to convert it to neutrals without uh, losing much of the kinetic energy. And you can do this at different uh, laser intensities and show that this focal spot size thing works. Now the question is what is happening? Why is the laser focal spot uh, helping? So uh, the normal mechanism or is this uh, charge separation. The electrons move out of the target produce a, a quasi static electrostatic fields that's what is called as target normal sheet acceleration the sheet potential that is developed in about a picosecond stays for about 5 picoseconds or 10 picoseconds and then ions move within that and are accelerated in that time so now the the interpretation that we have is that when you change your uh, laser uh, focal disturb uh, waste you actually change the plasma plume characteristics and which can change your electron energy combination. That is because uh, when you have a laser, as I said, you know, there is a contrast that is very, very important. So even when my peak intensity is 10 to the 18 watts per kilometer square, that is happening only in 100 picosecond, 100 femtosecond regime. But if I go down even to like one or two picoseconds where the electrons and ions can start doing some movement, you see that uh, the intensity is actually not uh, very low. It is already uh, 10 to the 14, watts per meter square, which can lead to ionization and plasma uh, generation. So if you now uh, use this condition of the laser pulse that we have and measure how the plasma plume changes with the focal waste, you can see that from 10 microns to 120 microns, the plasma plume actually is quite different. And when the ions move through this focal volume, uh, through this plasma plume, the electron ion con uh, conditions are very different. The plasma temperature is different, the plasma scale length is different because of which electron decombination should be different. So the most important uh, thing that happens by this, the focal waste changes the pre-plasma intensity dramatically because you know R square effect of the focal volume. So you can actually controllably change the electron temperature without losing the electron density. So that is the beauty here. The electron density actually increases but if you look at the electron temperature, we are going from a 2 kV temperature as calculated by the hydrodynamic uh, simulations to something like 40 to 60 uh, eV. This is uh, 0 0.06 kV, which is 40 to 60 eV. Now, 40 to 60 eV is already large, but it's not uh, that bad for undergoing electron decombination when you have a scale length of uh, 300 microns for uh, 400 microns. And uh, because uh, though uh, the, when the electron temperature is lower from 1 kV to 60-70 kV, the, the electron uh, ion recombination cross-section changes and it's a very good effect of temperature. So here I'm showing that there is a six orders of magnitude change from 10 eV to 2 eV. Of course, 60 eV is much larger, but it gives us in the ballpark of 10 eV for uh, effective uh, charge transfer to uh, electron ion recombination to happen. So we do a uh, uh, proper uh, uh, computation of that uh, electron recombination that happens. This is done in collaboration with uh, James Colgan from uh, Los Alamos. And uh, so we create the electron density and temperature and the scale length from the hydrodynamic simulation. And then we use the electron recombination calculations, including all the sophistication uh, built over many years in the atomic physics. And then you can see that the effective scale length of uh, neutralization can be quite reduced. So if you have a 10 micron, the, uh, you need to have um, uh, almost three times larger scale length for it to happen. 
whereas for uh, 120 microns, it is much smaller scale. So this is, uh, of course, we are not doing a virtual calculation of the experiment because the experiment uh, as to how, when the ions move, when the electrons move, when, how much of this electron ion interaction, how far it is there, is not a simple physics to, uh, uh, to capture completely, but we can do a phenomenological calculation and show that there is a dramatic increase, a decrease in the, the scale length over which nucleation can happen and effectively the probability being much uh, modified. So this is the uh, electron decombination. Uh, of course, I am at uh, already at the end of this story, but uh, um, can I take five more minutes or eight more minutes? Yeah, sure. I, we started at four or five, so I still have 10 yeah, minutes. Sure, sure. So, okay, so I will talk about the third story, which is uh, high contrast pulses and hydrogen atom which was, uh, as I said, was motivated by the possible applications to uh, 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 plasma applications. But more importantly, it was a fun uh, thing to try because we want to look at nuclearization on, in a conditions where the last 20, 30 years, nobody thought, nobody saw, nobody measured nuclearization. So we are now talking about an experiment where I have even higher intensity and more importantly, much better contrast, where I had 10 to the 4 contrast, now I'm talking about 10 to the 9 contrast, which means the pulse rises much more dramatically. I don't have this plasma plume. And that's where actually the, uh, the even the charge states or atomic species that we accelerate changes. If you are looking at the front of the target, because of the plasma plume at low contrast, you have dominant accel uh, acceleration of heavy ions, like uh, if you put a copper, you put a copper target. Uh, you get copper atoms uh, being very high energy. You get protons and carbons, but those are very, very small. Uh, by the way, the protons and carbons come because the experiments are done in a 10 minus 5 or uh, 10 minus 4 or kind of vacuum. And uh, there will always be a monolayer of protons or, uh, or and uh, carbon on the target unless you anneal it and heat it with another laser pulse to, to clean the surface. Otherwise, you get always uh, protons and carbons. But and they, since the ions from the outermost layer are, are the ones that are effectively accelerated, the protons and carbons are always come. But if you have, and, and this happens a lot more for a high contrast pulse. So even if you put a aluminum target, for example, you actually don't get aluminum ions at all because most of the target sheet potential is taken away by the protons and carbon. And protons becomes actually the most dominant. This, uh, this is not, of course, a true scale picture. A proton uh, in, uh, yield will be about uh, 40 to 100 times larger than carbon. So, but uh, uh, there is always this big center spot. And if you look at in the last 20, 30 years, almost everybody has interpreted that this big center spot is due to, due to be the photons and neutrons because you have uh, uh, a, a few joule or a few uh, uh, hundreds of microjoule laser pulse being hit on a target and you're looking straight into the target. So whatever you do with a microchannel plate detector or any other detector that you see, you do see a big photon flux because even if you put other kind of detectors, you'll always produce very high energy gamma rays. Uh, when I say gamma rays, I'm talking about spectrum anywhere between 1 keV to 1 MeV uh, X-rays being generated. Uh, they will always be there. So photons, very high flux of photons will always be there. So almost everybody has interpreted in the last 20 years these to be largely due to photons. And, uh, and that photons are also supposed to give a huge electromagnetic pulse noise and because of which you can't do a time of flight like the way I have uh, told because uh, there is a huge EMP pulse even if there are high energy protons or high, high energy hydrogen atoms that are being generated, they will arrive in about 100 to 100 nanoseconds and you can see the uh, noise here, the noise is so intense that you don't see it at all. This, uh, there's a peak at 300, 400, that will be due to the carbon ions uh, of uh, around 1 MeV. So the question is, are there neutral atoms even in these harsh conditions? And we are talking about now a thin target even at the back of the target. So what we did was uh, uh, made the conventional targets to, uh, to a gated target. What I mean is, Basically, instead of having a constant bias on a microchannel plate, we actually apply a gated voltage. 
so that I switch on the gate or the detector only when I want to see the atoms or ions. So uh, what we do is we actually change this gate and uh, measure the, uh, the, the spectrum. Here, for example, as I translate the gate from uh, 440 to 450 to 460 and so on, you can see that the, uh, the bright central spot starts diminishing and by about uh, 60 nanoseconds, all the uh, uh, bright central spot is completely gone. And then after that, if you see, there is a dramatic uh, raise between 500 to 1000 of uh, this uh, spectrum. So if you look at no gate spectrum, this is what you have. If you put with the gate, you can see that all the, and, and here we are putting a gate where you only see the hydrogen atoms, either uh, because arrival time will be very similar if you have the same kinetic energy, and you see the protons and hydrogen very, very beautifully, very, very clean. And uh, you can actually interpret this even in this uh, highly uh, uh, noisy line, we can actually pick up the neutrals. We can, as I said, we can actually measure the neutral atom spectrum by uh, scanning this gate and looking at the integral spectrum and differentiating. Uh, so this is the neutral atoms. You can see systematically as I change the gate, my uh, brightness of the sp central spot increases. I measure this uh, 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 differential sig uh, signal and when you dif uh, integral signal and when you differentiate it, you actually get a neutral atom uh, energy spectrum for the hydrogen. And we know it is only hydrogen, nothing else, because the arrival time uh, spectrum does not show us any more uh, high carbon. Now, so we can clean this very, very nicely, where uh, not only we see neutrals, but in the right in the opposite quadrant, you see negative ions. So we have actually seen the first experimental demonstration of H plus going to H zero to H minus without any other surface, any other method of electron ion recombination. And hydrogen atom is one of the hardest thing to capture an electron because it doesn't have any uh, uh, excited states that are uh, metastable. <clears throat> so H minus, direct H minus is actually very, very difficult. We do see it, we do measure it, and you get this neutral atom spectrum. And the next few minutes I will tell you that the neutral uh, rate at something like 10 to 100 K, uh, 20 kV is actually much, much larger than what any of us have imagined in this kind of conditions. It's almost 60%. It is 200 times larger than what is expected. And so we, uh, how we expect that, <coughs> as I said, even for the short pulse, we can actually calculate what is the electron density, electron temperature, and we can calculate what is the hydrogen atom capture of a free electron in this uh, plume, and we can calculate what is the percentage that's possible. Even in the worst case scenario of the lowest temperature that we can possibly think, for example, uh, assuming that the ions will start after 25 picoseconds and the temperature has gone cold, even then our temperature is about 1 keV and this is not possible at all. Uh, the only way that is possible to produce uh, electron capture that is 50% uh, or 60% is if you uh, reduce your electron temperature down to 1 or 2 uh, EV, irrespective of what the density is. Though I have shown this for 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 17, you can actually take three orders of magnitude higher density. It doesn't change too much. So not only that, if you just artificially change the electron temperature, let's say that, you know, for some reason, I do have a large fraction of low energy component, uh, more than what uh, normal plasma interpretation will give you. But if you see the electron spectrum, that if I just take this uh, 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 density and reduce the temperature, and if I go, even if I go down to EV, the kind of recombination and neutralization spectrum I get is very, very dramatically different from what uh, I expect. So this is what we are seeing, 80% going down to 10% uh, or so in about 25 keV, whereas here you see it is almost flat for 2 EV or 3 EV. So it should, the, characteristically, the, the spectrum is very different. It does not give anything correlating to the experiment. So the question is, where are these happening? Why is this happening? And it can't be charge transfer because the protons are the lightest ions which can move forward. There can't be anything ahead of it to undergo a charge transfer. And uh, ions, electrons are very, very fast and uh, would have, should have gone. But then we realize that there is uh, something more to the drama that can happen, which is, when ions are actually pulled 
because of the electrostatic force, it also pulls the electrons. Now, these electrons are very low energy. They start at much later time. So you have a co-propagation of low energy electrons along with the protons happening. And the neutralization in this case of Sudera can only happen after the ions are accelerated, which means it has to be at least you know, 20 to 100 microns far away from the target. And then the recombination has to happen. Can we see this experimentally? So we designed an experiment because if the neutrals are just going away, then you know you will see the neutral spot. But if I put now and apply a magnetic field and if the neutralization is happening in the far away from the target, then because of the magnetic field bending, the ion should bend. But then when the neutralization is happening in this magnetic field zone, you will see that the neutral spot should shift. So there should be a virtual shift in the source. I can use this. Uh, 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 imaging detector as a pinhole camera to look at, uh, you know, whether the uh, it is happening within 10 microns or 20 microns or 100 microns and how this neutralization spot should actually change with the magnetic field. And we do this and we show that uh, by systematically variation of the magnetic field, you see this neutral atom actually goes along the magnetic field bends. Uh, so, of course, the neutral atoms cannot bend, but it's the ions that bend and undergo neutralization along the path. So we can actually simulate this bending by a console. We can get exactly uh, uh, measure the, the shift in the neutral atom peak. And uh, you put the console with the kind of, kind of experimental conditions that you have, and you see the neutralization flux changing uh, effectively with that. And you can actually show this for different uh, ion energies and uh, laser uh, parameters. You can actually move the neutral atom spectrum by uh, tweaking with the laser plasma by putting uh, aluminum coated BK7 target and changing the effective temperature of the electron and ion moment. So uh, you can see here that we have 60% neutralization all the way to, to about 50, 60 kV. And these are uh, 10 micron source size beams. So in principle, one should be able to use it even for imaging applications. And in fact, the, new, the experiments in Hyderabad that are going on uh, are, we are able to actually see this neutralization, the images produced from neutral atom groups and the ion atom groups. So I will, that's a story for another day. Uh, so it, we can, even with the high contrast pulse, even in the worst of the conditions of the plasma, we do see 60 to 80 percent neutralization by playing with the electron and recombination uh, uh, parameters like temperature and density scale and so on and uh, show the experiments can be guided uh, properly with this co-propagating beam. They produce negative ions which can only be seen by this condition. And so this is my last slide. Say that, uh, you know, till about this 10 years ago, when you talk about lasers and laser plasmas as a new novel sources, people have only talked about ions and uh, electrons, but now we have a new chapter opened in terms of neutral atoms and even negative ions, which are scalable with the ion energy conditions, both in terms of ion distributions, ion temperatures, and so on and so on. So they are also uh, so it, it has been always there actually. We just didn't see them because we didn't think that they would be there. We always thought that sun spot was a big bright uh, source of light. It was not. Thank you. Sorry for. Uh, Five minutes extra. Uh, thanks, MK, uh, for this very nice overview of intense laser dense matter interaction. And now the talk is open for discussion and questions. So, um, anybody uh, has any questions? Please write in the chat box, and then we can take it up. Yeah, so Vaibhav has a question. Please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, MK, uh, the, the off the focus electron distribution, energy distribution, or temperature distribution that you showed, yeah. uh, for the inside to focus, I think at a lower, uh, uh, I mean, the, can, you, can you go back to that slide, please? Sure. In the clusters, right? Yeah, yeah. This, when, this. when you when you actually uh, not not the clusters the when you uh, go off the focus of the laser uh, beam uh, the solids experiment solids experiment yeah okay yeah this one 
Yeah, so you showed the uh, electron temperature plot as a function of uh, yes. not this, not this, uh, before this. Actually. This is the electron temperature density versus temperature. No, huh, no, okay. Uh, can you go down three slides? Uh, okay. This one, yeah. Yeah, here, correct. So you look at look at the blue curve at the mm. bottom from mm. 50 to 100 micron. Mm. Uh, it can in principle be a low energy electrons, right? A low temperature electron. No, no, blue curve corresponds to the blue scale, which is like 2 keV. I understand, but then from 50 to 100, mm. that, that, that scale, at that yeah. scale, this appears to be a very low temperature. And... Um, no, no, 1.5 keV is very large for electron decombination to take place. I agree, but look at the distance. 50 micron to 100 micron, the blue curve has a very low in, in temperature. True, true, true. I see this 100 to this is a plasma uh, from from the zero of the target. We have, we have computed the electron density, how it changes. At 200 microns, also, actually, yeah, it is there. There is a, a decent electron density. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that if you look at the blue curve mm. and if you expand it on the y axis, you will find that from 50 micron to 100 micron in that range or 50 mm. micron to 70 micron in that range, mm. the temperature will come out to be whatever the temperature that you are seeing in the, uh, in the brown, brown curve. Don't you think? No, no, no. If you look at the plot C, okay, you're saying at very, very high, uh, these things, it, it comes out to be 0.5. See the lowest scale here, if you see it's 0.5 uh, KV, that's still very large. See this for the uh, brown color, you should see this scale. For I the agree. blue color, I you should see this scale. And right. if I see, for example, 250 micron to 300 micron. No, no, no. I'm saying 50 micron to 70 micron. Oh, 50 to 70 micron is the range where the ions uh, have already, uh, you know, uh, have, uh, have come out, right? So there, because of the electron ions uh, being very, very, uh, but but that that uh, zone, the ion has not accel got accelerated. Okay, but then that is also the case for the uh, per, for the brown plot. No? no, no, wait, wait, wait. So, okay, there is one thing uh, you have to understand. This is not a, a calculation of the uh, 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 of the condition when the main pulse pulse hits. This is the calculation of the hydrodynamic calculation because of the pre pulse. I see. So, what happens is you have uh, uh, but in this uh, pre pulse condition of Two picoseconds or five picoseconds, uh, much of, not much of ion acceleration has happened. Okay. So you, it's it's like uh, at very close proximity, electron temperature is very low, but uh, so is the ion temperature low. Okay. Okay, I understand. So you will get uh, uh, neutral atoms in that regime, but they will be very low energy. They will not be high energy neutrons. Yeah, because there is no acceleration. And there is no acceleration, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you'll always get uh, neutral atoms uh, of low energy in this case of case. But the surprising thing was to produce, you know, 100 keV to 1 MeV neutral atoms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They uh, will go much, much faster because of the high velocity, right? Yeah, yeah. So they would have covered these 50 microns by, uh, uh, without much of interaction. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, EK has a couple of questions. Yeah, uh, MK. Yeah. I have two very simple questions. Yes. Uh, the first one is instead of, uh, this is related to the solids, instead of shifting the focus away from the uh, surface, surface, yeah. no? Yeah, yeah, surface. Can't you simply reduce the intensity of the pulse? Then what happens? I uh, know. So if you reduce the intensity of the pulse, your main pulse intensity also goes down. So the ion energy goes down. You don't yes, that's what I'm talking. I'm talking about the main pulse intensity only. I'm talking about. So the the thing is, if you so you, you mean to say the pre pulse is an essential requirement. Absolutely. For I see. Okay. It's an essential requirement. In fact, now we are soon realizing even for ion acceleration that is important. That's okay. the reason, though. Even though we change the focal base from 10 microns to 40 microns or 100 microns, mm -hmm. in principle, the intensity should have fallen by a factor of uh, uh, two orders of magnitude. Ion energy should have gone down much more dramatically. Okay. But you see the maximum energy hasn't changed much. Okay. So I'm sure you would have checked it out by two separate smaller intensity pulses, one as pre-pulse and one as... Of course. The, of course. Your, we did okay. the pump probe to cross-check this whole thing. Okay. Very good. So this, is, this we do with the high contrast pulse. Okay. 
And second question is very simple one. The what sort of materials for the again solids? You said you have used some insulators and things like that. What are the materials you tried out so far? Uh, we tried uh, copper, uh, aluminum, BK7, aluminum coated BK7, nanoparticle coated uh, glass, nanoparticle coated aluminum. Okay, but all these are low, relatively low Z materials. Have you tried any something into the rare earths or something like that? No, no, we haven't tried. Yeah. Maybe you should try that. We tried the tungsten because we were trying to compare with the tungsten foil. I know, I'm talking about you can do uh, oxides, rare earth oxides or something like that. But, uh, frankly, what happens is most of the iron energies in the uh, high contrast pulse is taken only by the protons. Even if you put a copper target, you don't see any copper atoms at all. Oh, I see. Any high energy. If you, I mean, when I say I, I don't see it, I always talk about like, you know, high energy ions, 10 kV, 20 kV plus. Anything lower than that, we won't even bother to measure it. That's oh, I see. Okay. Now, I was wondering the high Z atom had their own uh, special properties in enhancing the ch uh, charge transfer and things like that. That's true, what I was. True, true. Because, and their velocity will be very low uh, compared to uh, these guys. So they have an actually larger time for recombination to happen. That's why copper was also already big enough for us in that sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. To, All right. uh, okay. We did with this, with, by the way, we also did with gold. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, you see at that time when we were doing these gold experiments, we didn't realize that these are all neutrals. We were all uh, going through the standard uh, interpretation of everybody in the field saying that, oh, that must be uh, X-rays. Okay. All right. Only after this madness of neutralization, we saw. In fact, uh, you, uh, I, even uh, negative ion uh, fraction, even at the highest contrast pulse is 1 in 10 to the 5. Wow. It's not very large, but it's 1 in 10 to the 5. And uh, uh, one of our recent research paper actually is to show that a lot of people claimed uh, their electron spectrum that because they thought the only charge state that is possible is electrons. Yeah. They interpreted everything as electrons. Okay. But if you look at uh, where a hundred, a 10 MeV electrons come, there is almost the same fraction of uh, a 10 minus 5 fraction of uh, hydrogen atoms, uh, negative ion hydrogen coming. Okay. So there is a lot of misinterpretation of the data in the last 20 years, I would say, because they didn't think that there will be negative ions in this kind of plasmas. Okay. okay. So in fact, when I told uh, uh, these RAL people, now uh, they actually immediately went and cross-checked all their data. Uh, and uh, their interpretation was that you have aluminum foil, which will stop the uh, H- minus going and hitting the target. But then we found that H- minus hitting the target actually produces uh, a, a electron signal or a, uh, a, a X-ray signal which is detected by the gate. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, MK. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have one question. Yeah. So in the last part of your talk, yes. uh, you were mentioning this um, interaction with the solid surface. Yes. Right? And then the recombination was attributed to low energy electrons being pulled by the high energy ions. Yes. Am I right? Yes. Right. So, um, now, my guess is the target was mounted, uh, uh, I mean, in a, uh, so the target was not isolated, right? It was electrically, uh, you know, electrically conducting. Uh, yeah, the, but uh, Aditya, what happens yeah. here is most of the physics of ion acceleration is one picosecond plus. Right. Okay. So that's the reason why whether you use a glass target or a copper target, which is uh, grounded to the chassis, mm -hmm. it doesn't make any difference. Okay. I mean, you, I, uh, the 10 micron region is in a, uh, in a different uh, uh, conditions uh, completely. Yes. That sense of the word. No, I mean, so for a, so for a uh, metallic target, mm. if you continue this yes. right, over time, then mm. will there be effect of uh, charging of the target itself? No, uh, you have to remember one thing. When the, um, uh, uh, 10 picoseconds after the laser is hit or 100 picoseconds after the laser hit, if it is a foil, there is no matter left there. If it is a thick okay. target, there is a pit of about uh, 40 microns or 50 microns. Matter is completely ablated out. Oh, okay. okay, okay. So when we do a solids experiment, we actually raster the target so that you go to a fresh new spot. All right. Okay. So in fact, uh, that's one of the uh, things that I wanted, we, we, uh, which I'm not, I didn't talk about. So if you look at the same spot, because of the dip or the gadda that you make, mm -hmm. you actually change the electron recombination uh, 
uh, things completely. So what we do is we take you know one shot, two shots, three shots, five shots, uh, right. take an ECM picture of the pit that uh, that gets hit by the laser in the high contrast pulse and see like how the uh, uh, plasma emission, uh, the density profile and the temperature changes because we do see uh, quite interesting changes in the neutralization. Okay, okay thanks. So I think there are no more questions. Uh, so uh, let me thank MK again on behalf of the society. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, the next colloquium is scheduled for 7th of August. And details of it will be sent to you uh, later. So thank you all. Thank you, guys.